Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNO Audiobooks, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Social Sciences, SOSS, Postgraduate Certificate in Gandhi and Peace Studies, PGCGPS, MGP 001 Gandhi, The Man and His Times, Block 1 Making of Gandhi, Unit 3 Indian Influences, Epics, Narratives, Gita, Rai Chanbhai, Folklore, 3.1 Introduction Gandhi's very struggle for freedom was the result of the deep impact of Indian philosophy. He was better known as the Mahatma, as he represented a complete accord between his thought, word and deed, and moral and spiritual values against the forces of barbarism. One finds in him a harmonious blend of saint lines and statesmanship in his long career as a social reformer, a political leader, a saint, a true lover of humanity, and an apostle of peace and nonviolence. Gandhi was a fine product of Indian culture. He was nurtured and sustained by the perennial inspiration of Indian philosophy, said to represent the confluence of all that is best in the Indian thought from the early Vedic age to the age of the modern Indian Renaissance. It has been rightly observed that Gandhi embodied in himself the highest ideals of ancient Indian civilization, aims and objectives. After studying this unit, you will be able to understand the various Indian influences on Gandhi, in general, the influence of the Ramayana and the Bhagavad Gita, the influence of other scriptures and folklore, and the influence of Raichand Bhai, 3.2 influence of the Ramayana, though born into a staunch Vaishnav house and deeply aware of his mother's religious inclination and practices, Gandhi initially showed no inclination for any kind of religious belief. He had not even let himself be tied down to his family's strict vegetarian fare influenced by a Muslim friend, he had readily succumbed to meat-eating. Then, all at once, he was drawn into the reading of the ancient epic, the Ramayana. It happened, under curious circumstances, while his father was recovering from an illness in Porbandar, every evening he used to listen to a reading of the Ramayana by a great devotee of Rama, one Lada Maharaj of Bileshwar. It was said of Lada Maharaj that he cured himself of his leprosy, not by any medicine, but by applying to the affected parts bilva leaves which had been cast away after being offered to the image of Mahadev in Bileshwar temple and by the regular repetition of the Ramayana. His faith it was said, had cured him of his affliction. Gandhi writes in his autobiography that listening to Lada Maharaj's reading of the Ramayana was a delightful and fascinating experience. To quote Gandhi, Lada Maharaj had a melodious voice. He would sing the dohas, couplets, and chopais, quatrains, and explain them, losing himself in the discourse and carrying his listeners along with him. I must have been thirteen at that time, but I quite remember being enraptured by his reading. That laid the foundation of my deep devotion to the Ramayana. Today, I regard the Ramayana of Thulsidas as the greatest book in all devotional literature. Yet another experience deserves mention. As a young schoolboy, Gandhi was in perpetual dread of ghosts, thieves and serpents. He could not sleep at night without a light in the room. An old maid in the family, Rambha, offered the suggestion that by frequent recitation of religious verses from the Ramayana, he could be rid of those absurd fears. Gandhi relates this experience in his autobiography, I had more faith in Rambha than in her remedy. And so at a tender age, I began repeating Ramnama to cure my fear of ghosts and spirits. This was, of course, short-lived, but the good seed sown in childhood was not sown in vain. I think it is due to the seed sown by that good woman Rambha that today Ramnama is an infallible remedy for me. 
Close to his 60th year, casting his eyes back to his boyhood days, Gandhi acknowledged his debt to that good woman Rambha. In his words, when a child, my nurse taught me to repeat Ramnama whenever I felt afraid or miserable, and it has been second nature with me with growing knowledge and advancing years. I may even say that the word is in my heart, if not actually on my lips all the twenty-four hours. It has been my saviour. In the spiritual literature of the world, the Ramayana of Thulsidas takes a foremost place. It has charms that I miss in the Mahabharata and even in Valmiki's Ramayana. At this juncture, it must be clarified that Gandhi's Rama, the Rama of his prayers, was not the historical Rama, the son of Dashratha, the king of Ayodhya. According to Gandhi, Rama is the eternal, the unborn, the one without a second. Him alone I worship. His aid alone I seek. Yet another clarification may be in order here, relating to Gandhi's views on God, Truth and Rama. In his words, Though my reason and heart long ago realized the highest attribute and name of God as Truth, I recognized Truth by the name of Rama God, Rama and Truth became, in Gandhi's mind, synonymous, interchangeable terms. It is worth recalling that twice, when confronted with death, he uttered the words, He, Rama. On the first occasion, when he was beaten brutally on a South African street, he is stated to have fallen down unconscious with the name of Rama on his lips. It happened again at the prayer ground in New Delhi on 30th January 1948. Struck by an assassin's bullets, he Ram were the last words he is stated to have uttered, with one trembling hand raised in forgiveness and blessing before falling to the ground. 3.3 Influence of the Bhagavad Gita A few words about the contents of the Bhagavad Gita may be useful here. It is a poem of 700 stanzas of 2 to 8 lines each and divided into 18 discourses. The verses vividly narrate the historic warfare between two royal houses tied by kinship. The Gita is a small part of the epic, the Mahabharata. The date of its composition is ascribed to the period between the 5th and 2nd centuries BC. Gandhi read the Bhagavad Gita in his early youth in an English version in 1889. As a student in London, he was barely 20 years old. Up to that time, the concept of Ahinsa had hardly entered his awareness. He had been strongly moved in his boyhood by a Gujarati poem, the essence of which was that even one's enemy could be won over with love. In London, when some English friends made him read the song Celestial, his reaction was unexpected and quick. He has recorded that he read the entire contents of the book with fascination and that he was particularly impressed by the last 19 verses of the second chapter. It was long after his student days in London that Gandhi, having improved his Sanskrit, read the Gita in the original and even translated it into Gujarati with his comments and notes. This volume was released on 12th March 1930. This version was retranslated into English by Mahadev Desai a word, first, about the impact of the Gita on Gandhi deserves mention. He is on record as having stated that this work, along with the Upanishads filled his whole being, and that he found in it a solace that he missed even in the deeply stirring sermon on the Mount. The Gita was, for him, the key to the world's scriptures. In 1925, he wrote in Young India, When doubts haunt me, when disappointments stare me in the face, and when I see not one ray of light on the horizon, I turn to the Bhagavad Gita and find a verse to comfort me, and I immediately begin to smile in the midst of overwhelming sorrow. My life has been full of external tragedies, 
and if they have not left any visible and indelible effect on me, I owe it to the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita again. In 1936, Gandhi wrote in Harijan, The Gita has become for me the key to the scriptures of the world. It unravels for me the deepest mysteries to be found in them. I regard them with the same reverence that I pay to the Hindu scriptures. Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Parsis, Jews are convenient labels. But when I tear them down, I do not know which is which. We are all children of the same God. Mahadev Desai stresses this point thus, every moment of Gandhiji's life is a conscious effort to live the message of the Gita. Orthodox Hindu pundits, however, looked upon Gandhi as a renegade and they drew from him the following comment, For me, Sanatna Dharma, Orthodox Hinduism, is the vital faith handed down from generations and based upon the Vedas and the writings that followed them. For me, the Vedas are as indefinable as God and Hinduism. The Vedas are remnants of the discourses left by unknown seers. Then arose a great and lofty-minded man, the composer of the Gita. He gave to the Hindu world a synthesis of Hindu religion, at once deeply philosophical and yet easily to be understood by any unsophisticated seeker. It is the one open book to every Hindu who will care to study it. Even if all other scriptures were reduced to ashes, the 700 verses of this imperishable book are quite enough to tell one what Hinduism is and how one can live up to it. The impact, however, is an intrinsic part of the interpretation. In Gandhi's view, the canon of interpretation is to scan not the letter but to examine the spirit. He believes that the Gita is an allegory describing the inward conflict in which mankind is perpetually involved. The literal interpretation of the texts is, of course, far simpler. The verses vividly narrate the historic warfare between two royal houses tied by kinship. When Arjuna, the great Pandav warrior, shrinks from the obligation to destroy his own people in battle, he is reminded by Krishna, his divine charioteer and friend that the warrior's duty takes precedence over all else. On the other hand, treated as an allegory, the fight is between the baser impulses in us as represented in Duryodhan, and the higher impulses, as in Arjuna, our own body being the field of battle. Here is a never-ending struggle between the forces of darkness and of light, not the picture of what happened thousands of years ago, but that of what is going on today in every human heart. In Gandhi's words, it is the description, not, of a war between cousins, but between the two natures in us, the good and the evil. It is the description of the eternal duel going on within ourselves given so vividly as to make us think, for the time being, that the deeds described therein were actually done by human beings. The Gita, says Gandhi, presents some basic problems which are hard to solve. But it is free from any kind of dogma and it gives us in a short compass a complete reasoned moral code which satisfies the intellect as well as the heart. Its appeal is universal. In any case, the author of the Gita proves the futility of war. The victories amid the debris of destruction have produced nothing but misery. What difference would it have made if the vanquished had won? Gandhi stresses that it is wrong to be obsessed with the battles and their result. While some of the verses in the Gita cannot be easily reconciled with the teaching of non-violence, it is far more difficult to set the whole of the Gita in the framework of violence, nevertheless, the central teaching of the Gita. According to Gandhi's interpretation, is not Himsa but Ahimsa, this is proved mainly in the 2nd and 18th chapters. The logic 
he uses is that while hinsa is impossible without anger, attachment and hatred, the Gita takes us to a state that excludes all petty nuances of violence. What, then, is the object, the means and the message of the Gita as understood by Gandhi? Its object is to show the best way of attaining self-realization. But what is the means to that end, which is indeed the essence of all religious endeavours? Desirelessness, renunciation of the fruits of action, this is the centre around which the Gita is woven and how is this renunciation to be achieved? In the words of the Gita, as quoted by Gandhi in his article, the message of the Gita, by desireless action, by renouncing the fruits of action, by dedicating all activities to God, that is, by surrendering oneself to Him, body and soul. And for this purpose, right knowledge is imperative, the knowledge based on true devotion. This devotion is no blind faith and does not involve rosaries, offerings and the like. It is no intellectual feat but a constant heart churn. The true devotee is selfless, ever forgiving, unaffected by happiness and misery, sorrow and fear and exultation. He treats friend and foe alike. He is untouched by respect or disrespect, praise or blame. He has a disciplined reason and loves silence and solitude. And finally, devotion of such caliber is inconsistent with strong attachments. Gandhi quotes the Gita's words, Do your allotted work, but renounce its fruit, be detached and work, have no desire for revolt. This, he believes, is the Gita's unmistakable teaching. Mahadev Desai has discussed this interpretation ably in his book, The Gospel of Selfless Action. It is from this premise that Gandhi moves forward to Ahimsa. If there is no desire for fruit, there can be no ground for Ahimsa. At the back of violence, there is the desire to attain the desired end. Gandhi, however, is not dogmatic on this point. The Gita was not written, he admits, to establish Ahimsa. In those ancient times, the contradiction between Ahimsa and warfare was barely visible. Even so, Gandhi had complete faith in the wisdom of the sage who composed the Gita. The Gandhian interpretation of the Gita has not been accepted without challenge. In fact, it has been rejected by scholars who take the traditional view. Gandhi, they say, has distorted the meaning of the Gita, superimposing on it his own concept of nonviolence. Killing under certain circumstances was a duty that the Gita affirmed. There was no plausible ground to say that the Gita represented the eternal conflict between the forces of good and those of evil. Besides, Gandhi was reading the Gita in the light of the Sermon on the Mount. Commenting on this, Vincent Sheen writes, An assumption that this was a Christian interpretation of the Gita is, it seems to me, an unjustifiable step. If you grant him the initial bold leap, in which Kurukshetra becomes the heart of man, all the rest of his interpretation is well within the framework of the Upanishads and the text of the Gita. His reasons for making that bold leap were all based upon his perception of self-evident truth, i.e. self-evident to him, as shown by the long study of the Gita itself. Answering adverse comments, Gandhi confirmed in the strongest terms that non-violence was a tenet common to all religions. and that, in India, its practice was reduced to a science. Even if that practice was now nearly dead, the eternal law of answering anger by love and of violence by non-violence could well have a revival apart from Ahinsa. The second great principle that Gandhi derived from the Gita was that of Karma Yoga, the path of action after the publication of his Gujarati translation of the Gita in 1930, Gandhi in Yervada, jail, received a complaint from an ashram member that the book was difficult to understand. In reply, Gandhi wrote a series of letters to the ashram, each of which dealt with a particular chapter of the Gita. 
द फर्स्ट लेटर वॉज रिटन ऑन फोर्थ नवंबर 1930. दीज लेटर्स वर ट्रांसलेटेड इन टू इंग्लिश बाय वी जी देसाई एंड रिलीज इन बुक फॉर्म इन 1960 अंडर द टाइटल डिस्कोर्सेज ऑन द गीता द एसेंस ऑफ कर्मा योगा वॉज एक्सपाउंडेड इन गांधीज डिस्कोर्सेज कृष्णा एक्सप्लेन्स टू ग्रीव स्ट्रिकन अर्जुना 